lunch. And those of you who are able to come, I would love to get to know you. Uh, it's difficult on, uh, in a large crowd like this to get to know people, so we have a smaller room where we try to get to know each other. And I would love to spend some time with you. That is immediately after this service across the parking lot. I want to teach or preach, however it is unveiled, from this subject, what is God looking for? What is God looking for? And I want to ask you to take a journey with me for a few moments. I promise not to preach over three or four hours. Just a few moments of your time, I'd like you to take a journey with me. And I would like us to consider some things together and try to answer this issue, answer this question of what is it that God is looking for. Will you preach with me? Yeah. Come on, we can do better than that. Will you preach with me? Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to depend on you to do that. My voice is giving me some trouble uh, because it thinks it's still on vacation. It has a bit of a bad spirit, not unlike my wife, and uh, is rebellious. Just kidding, honey. I love you. Although you did blow, uh, make obnoxious sounds at everybody up here. And I don't know if you should maybe accept Christ as your personal Savior or something, but there needs to be some improvement happen around here. That's all I have to say about that. No, doesn't Charlie do a great job uh, greeting us all? It's one of my, I honestly, I have no, I, every Sunday, and when she walks up, I'm like, there is no telling which way this is going to go. <laughs> so I give, I'm receiving some of my own medicine. We are all of us striving to live by faith. Can I have a big amen? amen. It's not easy to live by faith. If it were easy, we all would do it and we all would have more success at it. But faith is the choice you make to see a world one way that often appears the other, I should explain. Through the eyes of faith, things look differently for a believer. You see, you are not standing in your own abilities, but you have the promises of God in your life. Can I have some agreement on that one? You have the promises of God upon your life. You have his presence with you. You, has his, you have his word as a gift in your life. And if you choose to, you can live by a completely different kingdom other than the kingdom of this world. You can live by a different order. You, if you choose to do so, can see your circumstances not just through the eyes of a modern person living in the New South in this year of our Lord, 2019, making it hopefully as good as you can, hopefully with enough education for your context, hopefully with enough money for your light bill, et cetera, et cetera. That's one way to see your world. On the other hand, you have this divine invitation that has been given to you through the word of God, through the presence of God that asks you if you can live by a different order, by a different spiritual economy, if you can see not with eyes of the flesh, but if you can see with eyes of the spirit. This is a challenge that is offered to every generation that would see the works of God expressed among it. And this image is repeated in the scripture, starting with Abraham, the father of the faithful, is this opportunity not to live by the perceptions of the flesh, not to live by the evidence of your eyes, but to choose to see the world in a spiritual manner. Let me say this part of it again. That's not easy. Sometimes you feel terrible and the spirit invites you to believe for healing. And you can live according to feelings and aches and pains and all sorts of physical misery. Or you can stare the mountain of your moment of illness in the eye and say, be ye removed, be cast into the sea. In the name of Jesus, I proclaim healing over this sick body. Now to an unbeliever, this seems crazy. This seems like, why would you choose to live this way? I, you, I know you feel your sick body. I know you're aware of the weakness that is in you. I know you get it. It's not like you're hiding these realities from yourself. And yet you're looking at the realities and you're saying, I choose to believe that God is working. You're saying, I choose to believe that God can heal me. You're saying, I choose to believe that he can make a way in the midst of all of this chaos. You're choosing that. This literally, hear me today, is what it means to be a person of faith. Amen. 
For Abraham, it was turning away from a world that he was comfortable with. He was comfortable in a context. He was comfortable there with his fathers and his father's fathers. And they had a whole history there. They weren't nomadic. They were people of the land. They probably were a part of an agrarian community. And the Lord said, take your family, leave, leave or take your immediate family, leave your extended family, and go look for a place that I will show, show you. Look for a different kind of city and more than that, a different kind of life. That is exactly what the Spirit has invited each one of you to do. Not to live an, a, a, a life of, of flesh, carnal understanding, but can you walk in the realm of the Spirit? Can you see the world that is beyond this world? Now, if we fail to do that, we become much less effective for the kingdom of God. Yes. I believe that you are being challenged in your life by God to step up on faith and speak to the mountains that you are facing. And then having experienced the power of God, you are invited to testify that your God is a way maker. I wonder if there's anybody who knows a way making God in this house. Is there anybody here with a testimony of a God who broke down the walls of resistance in your life? Is there anybody here with a testimony that can say, I have a witness and this is my witness. My God is a way maker. So I, let me give you a quote from a uh, Christian author and philosopher C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite places in, to go or people to read, I should say. He said this, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Once you have a sense of God working in your life, it's not just a choice to believe in God. Suddenly, everything else in your life is put in a different perspective. That's why Christians can mourn, but not like people who haven't any hope. You see, it's not just that the sun has risen. It's that the sun has given us light that we might see. And everything changes. Your relationship to this world changes. Your relationship to a career changes. Your relationship to fear. Your relationship to struggle. All changes when they are illuminated by the light of Almighty God. But let's, let's not rush too fast. Lest we... Forget, or shall I say, fail to admit how difficult this can be choosing to live by faith. Uh, the author and minister A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I want to say that again. What comes into your mind whenever you think about God is the most important thing about you because that is the prism through which everything else is defined, everything else is organized, everything else is understood. What you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. I want to, in the manner of explaining the power of faith, and I'm preaching from this subject, what is God looking for? And addressing this subject of what God is looking for in our lives, uh, as opposed to what we are looking for in God, I, I, I think it's fair to admit that it is possible that uh, oftentimes we do a better job of asking ourselves what we want from God than asking ourselves what God wants from us. Uh, it is the nature of creation to invert the order and us judge God rather than God judge us. This is the reason why the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is really a tree of the personal assessment of judgment of others. We decide for ourselves what is good and evil and God wanted us to take his word for what was good and evil. Do you see, don't have time for that. I do however want you to consider for a moment the first principles of scripture that are shown in uh, all the way at the beginning in, in the story of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis. These are, these are foundational first principles that are very important for us to then understand the rest of our lives, the rest of biblical teaching through. What did God get from Adam and Eve? What was in it for God? Now, this is a question, not so much of theology, 
Christian theology, but a question of Christian philosophy. Uh, what was in it for God, and why would God make a garden, and why would God place a man and a woman of his creation in that garden? What was God looking for in this moment? This is, this is a pretty important question because it is going to shape the manner in which we see our Father in heaven, and it's going to shape the manner in which we serve him. Uh, if we think God is primarily a lawgiver, what we will do is we will see the world through the t terms of right and wrong, and uh, we'll be tempted to keep categories of who's doing right and who's doing wrong. If we see God primarily as a healer, we will see our work primarily as the purpose of helping people who are in pain. And so when someone's in pain, we're, we want to pray for them. Uh, none of these things are wrong. They all are elements of the larger story of the God we serve. The Gospels, however, invite us to see God not as the lawgiver. That's how the Old Testament invites us to see him. They invite us to see him as a savior. Yes. Amen. You shall call his name Jesus. Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Not only that. The New Testament, the gospel, and I'm off my notes here, and uh, if you're trying to follow, by the way, you can download my notes that I'm preaching from at the church website. Just click pastor's notes and you'll have the notes I'm preaching from, and you can totally nerd out if you're a nerd. Uh, I, I, want to, I want you to see something here that uh, this, this, this moment in the gospels, uh, it's showing us God as a savior. Uh, Jesus, Jehovah has become my salvation, is showing us as God as a savior. Now the most disciplined people, Serving God at this time are the Pharisees. Nobody's stricter than the Pharisees, but Jesus seems the opposite of the Pharisees. The Pharisees insist as, uh, to see God as a lawgiver. And Jesus comes and says, look, they that be well have no need of a physician. That's not to say there is no point to law. That's not to say there's no point to the miraculous. That is to say this is how God is manifesting himself in this world that the world might be saved. Now, again, these are not primarily theological questions. They are in many ways questions of Christian philosophy. What did God get out of Adam and Eve in the garden? Why would he make beings and place them in a perfect place? Uh, the image the Bible gives us, and I love this image because I want you all to value it, and I want you all to uh, put it in your life. Uh, this, the image the Bible gives us of the interaction between God and Adam and Eve in a garden is this kind of an image. So Adam and Eve had responsibilities. He had stewardship. Uh, for example, just uh, the ordering of the garden, uh, the taxonomy. That's a fancy word for the naming of everything. He had this responsibility, and their day would pass, and the Bible gives us this image at the end of the day, as the cool of the evening settles across the garden, in the end of the day, the Lord would come and he would walk with Adam and Eve and they would be as friends. They would be as family. They be, would be, as a New Testament writer would say, in a sense, face to face face to face. In fact, when the Bible talks about the presence of God, that is a literal interpretation of uh, the ancient language, which means to be face to face. And when you're saying, I feel God's presence, you're saying, I feel like I am face to face with God. This is what God gets out of the relationship with Adam and Eve. God does not need Adam and Eve, but he gets something out of the relationship. I think the easiest way to understand it is in this terms of a love story. Yes where God loves us and he receives our love back to him. And in some way, in some way, he desires to receive our love. It's not enough just to have uh, beings worshiping him. He had that around the throne. He wants people to choose to worship him. Oh, I, I'm worried y'all miss what I just said there. It's not enough to have beings who are created to do it uh, in the sense of a program that if they do not follow, then they are judged. He wants beings uh, to choose it for the sake of love. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God is love. 
And if you're going to know God, you're going to have to commit yourself to being uh, the loving God and loving people. And there's this moment in this. And this, again, this is Christian philosophy. And so you see God spending time with them. It's almost as though they are together. They, are, they have presence together. And then Adam and Eve, they, of course, choose their own judgment of good and evil over surrendering to God's judgment of good and evil. And that is symbolically represented. I know I'm in a little bit of deep waters, but just let me swim for a moment and splash around. And I'll, I'll maybe get back to shore or I'll be eaten by an alligator. One of those two th- things will happen. And uh, so here, here, here is God. He is... He is he is receiving, he is giving, and he is receiving love. And uh, you see Adam and Eve, they are choosing their own sense of right and wrong by symbolically eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, where now, instead, get this, of God judging them, they are judging God. Yes. You'll see this fruit that is planted come to full fruition in the days of Noah, and they're all doing what is right in their own eyes. Nobody's submitting themselves to the word of God. Nobody's saying, not my way, your way. No one's saying, not my desires, your will. No one's saying, if there's any way to take this cup, take it. But if not, I will drink it. They, all of them, are seeking to hold God in the palm of their justice rather than placing themselves in the palm of God's justice. And so the story is broken. Sin has entered in. And that which was given as the gift of God, as a love story faced to face presence in the quiet of your day walking with God that is shattered and now they are separated through again symbolically an angel with a flaming sword you cannot come into the presence of God God does not settle for second he is either God over all or he's not God Do you see? You guys with me? And so this is broken now because of the rejection of God's way, God's word, and because of the arrogance of us judging God in the same manner that Lucifer exalted himself and said, I will do what formerly had been reserved unto the Lord in the same manner we elevated ourselves and fellowship presence is lost. Now, if this problem is going to be fixed, God's going to have to fix it because we don't know where to begin. Like a a day care full of toddlers, we are really good at making messes you know who you are but we're not very good at cleaning them up and God decides he's going to pay the price for our spiritual insurrection this is the gospel this is the gospel the love story that is told that is shown prophet after prophet and priest after priest and king after king and uh, teacher and preacher and finally Christ is born and he bears in his body the weight of all our transgressions And so now he, having attained holiness in the face of temptation, imparts to us a righteousness we could never attain ourselves. And we are thus made holy, not by our accomplishment, but by his accomplishment. Therefore, we worship him and not ourselves. You guys with me? Am I scaring you off? There's coffee outside if you start falling asleep. So this is the story that's told. So see what God got or imagine or consider in the, in, 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 as almost as a, a question of philosophy, what would God have got out of the relationship with Adam and Eve and why did sin break that and Christ died to restore it? But we separated from spirit and flesh, spirit and flesh. We separated. We are forced thus limited through flesh to see through a glass darkly in our being that we cannot see him. No man hath seen God at any time, and yet we are invited to be with him. And King Solomon, on the day he dedicates the temple, he asks this question of God. He says, will God abide with men? There were 120 priests ministering, and the Holy Ghost fell in that place. The fire fell. It was a sign of the Holy Spirit to be given on the day of Pentecost. The fire falls, and the 120 priests cannot minister because the presence of the Lord is so thick in that room. A thousand years later, or thereabouts, you get the idea. Uh, Here, uh, they're in the upper room and they're praying together. There's also 120. And again, the Lord answers this question, will God abide with men? Solomon had asked it in a quite vulnerable manner before all the people, will God abide with men? And fire fell on the day of Pentecost. 120 are in an upper room and they're seeking and they're believing and praying. And God answers the question again, yes. God will abide with men and the Holy Spirit is given. Amen. If you have never received the, the, the manifestation of tongues in your life, it can be a little bit intimidating in the beginning, especially if you were raised in a very safe religious environment. But I want you to know it is the greatest sign of 
the gift of the Holy Spirit that is shown anywhere in the scripture. And the reason why it's such a powerful sign is God still answers the question 2,000 years later that he will dwell with men. And he gives you a sign to let you know that he is dwelling with you. If you have not, if you've never spoken with tongues, I want you to begin to open your spirit to the possibility. It's nothing to strain for or strive for. It's a gift. And that's not my word. That's the biblical word. So we don't need to make a baseball bat out of something the Bible calls a gift. You just need to change the way you think about it and begin praising God and begin accepting and begin believing. I promise you, you can get the spirit. You can get a manifestation of tongues in your private life. Okay, back on, back on point. That's, none of that's in my notes. Um, so I want you to see God is still looking for this relationship. He wanted it so much that he paid our debt that he might restore it. And we now, having been washed in his righteousness, we now can see him but through eyes of faith. We cannot see him as he is. A day will come. The Bible says we'll be face to face. We'll see him as he is. A day's not here. Until then, how do we see him? Through faith. I want to read Romans 1 and 7. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3 and 11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. I want you to see the necessity of faith. Faith is not the end, but faith is the means. The end is the presence of God. The end is being in the presence of God. The end, you understand what I mean by the end and the means? The end is relationship with God. The end is walking with him as it were. That image of spending time in the quiet of the day with him. That image of hosting him as your body is now the temple of the Lord. Do you see? That's the end. What is the means? If we can't see him with eyes of flesh, how do we see them? Through eyes of faith. Faith is the, 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 the means whereby we are able to host the presence of God in our life. So if faith is the way to relationship, if faith is the way to hosting the presence of God, if faith is the way to manifesting the promises of God in our life and manifesting the presence of God in our community, if faith is the way, it's probably a pretty big deal. And the enemy probably fights our faith as much as he can. And circumstances probably attack our faith. Because without faith it is, oh come on now, you guys know the Bible on that. Don's over here asleep. He quotes the Bible every time I say something. He's going to sleep on me today. Without faith it is impossible. Thank you. Now get some coffee and we'll keep going here. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It seems like the enemy would attack you in your faith. Do you have any witnesses in the house? It seems as though God would want you to fight for your faith. It seems like the Bible would be a story of people who were heroes of faith. Okay, you just said 17 volumes of theology when you said that right there. Faith is the pathway to the presence of God. Yeah. Uh, faith is important because it is in some way uh, a measure of our spiritual potential. God has included you in his kingdom and he wants you to manifest his kingdom to your world. You are God's plan to manifest God's heart to your world. Yeah. You're going to do that through... Uh, Many ways. Let me give you three of them. You're going to celebrate the victory of the cross. You ought to be a walking testimony of the gospel. You're going to demonstrate, or, or shall I say, yeah, demonstrate the power of the name. You need to be speaking the name of Jesus and believing. And finally, you're going to manifest the heart of a Savior wow. to your world. Do you see? So you're going to celebrate the victory of the cross, demonstrate the power of the name, and manifest the heart of a Savior to your community. How are you going to do that? Through faith. You don't know enough, but faith speaks when you know not what to say. It is through faith. And faith defines your youthful usefulness to the kingdom of God. When I talk about the kingdom of God, I'm not primarily talking about salvation. Salvation is not your work. It's God's work. He has already done it. But you can be saved and never do anything for the kingdom of God. And you are a person of destiny. You have God's gift within you. You have God's talents and abilities invested in you. And you have this great call from heaven that you would see with heaven's eyes and love with God's heart and work in your vineyard. 
In fact, Jesus said there's no need to pray for the harvest. Pray for the laborers. That's exactly opposite of the way we do it, right? We pray for the harvest. God, stir them. God, touch them. God, save them. No, you're the problem. Wow. Pray for yourself, Lord. Help me to see with the love of heaven when I walk through my world. Help me to have confidence to speak the name of Jesus when I talk to someone who is hurting. Help me to manifest. Oh, my. If I could preach around here, I, now would be the time. Now would be the time, and this would be the place. I want you to know you manifest the kingdom of God. So let me say this. Uh, fear becomes a limit fear becomes a lid on your effectiveness in the kingdom of God because fear is where your faith goes to die yep. is that too dramatic fear is where faith goes to die uh, fear will destroy your kingdom potential we all of us have kingdom potential but fear will destroy your kingdom potential I believe in you and I believe that you are mighty in faith I believe that God is looking for people that will give him loaves and fishes. He's not looking for moving cafeterias on wheels. He's just looking for loaves and fishes. God will not do something without something to multiply. God will always start with an offering and multiply from there. God does not turn stones to bread. He takes loaves and multiplies them for the crowd. It's not the same thing. And sometimes I think we, like the devil, want to get God to turn stones into bread. And he wants to take our bread and multiply it for his purpose and his kingdom. So let me remind you of this. Faith will tell you you can make a difference in your world. Fear will say, just keep hiding in the house. Faith will say, you should pray for somebody. You never know what's going to happen. Fear will say, they'll think I'm crazy. Well, you wouldn't want to act out a lie. You know you're crazy. They might as well know you're crazy. Faith becomes a testimony. And the same person that laughed at you when you prayed will be the first one to call you when it's their kid who gets sick. You are God's voice. You, this is your destiny, my brothers and my sister. You have been called. You have been chosen. Now it's time for you to be full of faith. You have been called. You have been chosen. Now it's time for you to be full of faith. You have been called. All. You have been chosen. Now it's time for you to be full of faith. God's hand is upon you. And through faith, you see not just what is, but what could be. You see not just what we're settling with, but you see what God can do. Through faith, you talk to the person who is sick and you say, I believe God can heal you. Your faith puts God on the hook. Come on now. That's all faith is. I believe God could put your, your life back together again. I believe God could bring you through this. I want to be a voice of faith in your life. Look, I've been in ministry uh, most of all of my adult life. I have been preached. I have been a preacher. I've been a teacher. I've been an evangelist. I've been a pastor. I've been an associate pastor. Before that, I was in the praise man. I was a fantastic drummer. I was one of the best Christian drummers that ever lived. And uh, I'm trying to get with the politics of the day. I was people even today are saying I was the greatest drummer that ever lived. And I tried to be the greatest speaker, that a uh, singer that ever lived. But when I sang, people left church. I don't know. Not everyone's called. Not everyone's called, you know. And so they put me back on the drums. I I've taught Sunday school. I've mowed the church lawn. I've I, everything there is to do except women's ministry. And there was a time in my teens when I tried to do that. <laughs> and I succeeded too. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Moving along for the religious people. Just take a breath. Just breathe it. <sighs> be okay. I've been in this thing my whole life. How many of you guys have served God for more than a minute? Okay, so let's, let's get really, really transparent. As long as I've served God, as many years as I have studied the Bible, as many good words of encouragement as I've given to other people, hell still attacks me in my fear. And I get the opportunity to show my love to God by every day choosing faith in the face of my fear. Come on, stay with me. I'm trying to get done. I'm trying to get done. I get... 
I get to prove my affection for the kingdom of God by choosing faith in the face of fear. I get to show God I would rather let you judge me than arrogate to myself an ability to judge you. I get to choose that by simply being a person of faith. I get to manifest that by saying, God, not my way, your way. Not my will, your way it will. I don't know what the best decision would be, but I submit to this truth. You know the way that I take. I said, you know the way that I take, and I surrender this to you. I lay it at your feet. I, by an act of faith, shout as loud as I can into the realm of the spirit. I love you. The scripture gives us image after image of people who are victorious through faith. The whole book of Hebrews is about Christians persevering in faith. They go through much suffering, but they persevere. They walk not by sight. Somebody say, not by sight. They walk by faith. Uh, This is not simply a duty. This is not a plan for salvation, although without faith it is impossible to please God. What this is is a way of seeking faith the presence of God. We are seeking face to face with God. We are seeking to cross the bridge that he built. He removed the sand. We have to give our heart. I can't get, I can't keep taking these side roads here. I've got to get back on my notes. I want you to see this challenge in the spirit. It starts with Abraham and it goes all the way to the end where the lamb of God is expressed before all the world in the book of revelations faith these are they that came out from great tribulation they've been washed in the blood of the lamb this story of faith you are part of that story and every day you are given the opportunity to shout into the realm of the spirit as loud as you can i love my god i love the promises of god i live my life by those promises i build my family my house my everything upon that foundation I choose him I don't judge him I surrender to him he is the king of my life I am going to move down to three principles here uh, that will help you build your faith Uh, I want you to apply them in your own life now there are more than three and I'm I'm going to invite the musicians to come Uh, There are more than three principles in your life for building faith, but we are, of course, limited uh, to appropriate lengths of time. And as a communicator, I know I only have your attention for a, a little while. The first principle I want to give you that will build your faith and help you strengthen yourself is simply this. Whether you believe it or not, you are already a person of faith. You just are selective about what you believe in. You already believe in something. It may be... A political party it may be a politician God help you mm. so you know poly comes from the Greek word meaning many like polygamous <laughs> poly politician poly is many and ticks are blood-sucking animals and so politician means many blood-sucking animals that's funny I don't care what y'all say uh, You are already a person of faith. Poke your neighbor if it's appropriate and say, you are already a person of faith. Now ask him, what, are, what is it that you believe in? Faith comes from the Latin word fides, which means to rely upon or to trust something. Some of you trust friends and family. You have some friends that if they tell you they'll show up and help you move, you're surprised if they don't show up. Why? You trust them. You have other people, when they tell you they'll show up and they don't show up, it doesn't doesn't surprise you at all. You'd have been surprised if they showed up. (laughs) You already trust and believe in something. I want to invite you, instead of just trusting on the basis of your evidence, would you trust upon the basis of the promises of God? Would you begin to be a person who believes what God has said? My next principle is going to bring a little clarity to this, but I am inviting all of you. I am, 
admonishing myself also we must be people who believe the promises of God God is not a man that he should lie what the writer is saying is he has no need to lie he is not limited he's not a man man but the reason why men lie is because they promise things they can't deliver they're limited but it's just as easy for God to keep his word as it would be to lie because he's not limited he's not a man that he should lie the second principle of faith that I, I think that will help you grow in your personal, uh, personal faith is simply this. Uh, there is both clarity and mystery in serving God, and you have to embrace both clarity and mystery. Uh, I will read Deuteronomy 29 and 29. The Bible says the secret things belong to the Lord. Secret things belong to the Lord. We, we see that. The secret things belong to the Lord. However... Not everything's a secret. And there is in our hand both clarity and mystery. Luke writes to Theophilus and he says, I'm writing this to you, Theophilus, so that you may have or you would have certainty concerning the things you have heard. So just because you don't understand everything does not mean you don't understand anything. I want to say that again. Just because you don't understand everything doesn't mean you don't understand anything. There are things we know. I have a personal experience with the presence of God. Amen. I may not want to have a uh, long argument over modal monarchianism, which is a great theological concept if you'd like to look into it. I may not have all understandings into modal monarchianism or, or the like. But let me tell you what I do understand. I once was lost in sin and then Jesus shed abroad his love in my heart. He imparted to me his mercy. And in an altar I wept. Even, even as a young person I wept and I cried and I said, God, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'd like to give my life to you. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know where you could use me at the moment. Uh, it doesn't look like I have much to offer and then and, I, and things may not look up ever, but if there's any way you could use me, I'd like to give myself to you. Just because you don't know everything doesn't mean you don't know some things. You need to hold on to what you know, and you need to celebrate the promises of God. If God said it, it's going to happen. You may not know when, how, who, or the context, but you know God said it. It shall come to pass. So you're already a person of faith. You just need to exercise your faith in God. Secondly, Embrace both clarity and mystery. Don't let either one of them throw you off your stride. And the third principle for our teaching today is simply this. Learn to put God's word into practice. Paul explains it very intentionally through the image of an athlete preparing for a contest or preparing for games of some type. And Paul uses the language of the athlete to explain how to go grow stronger in your faith. In fact, Paul says, we should exercise our faith. Yes. Exercise. That's not my image. That's Paul's image. Um, what, so if you're not very strong, not, not everybody is, is, is super strong. Uh, like, you know, our worship pastor, he's super strong. But most of us aren't very strong. Uh, if you go to the gym, you try to lift 500 pounds. You know what? It's, it, you're going to break something. That's what's going to happen. Because you're not strong. Somebody say, preach to me. That was for you. You're not strong. You try to lift 500, 500 pounds, something's going to break. But don't let that be a reason why you don't try to lift 50 pounds. This is the image that Paul uses. You exercise your faith. You need to learn to speak to little mountains. I said you need to learn to speak to little mountains. Quit being impressed with your mountain and start being impressed with your God. And if you really want to obey the scripture, quit talking to God about your problem and start talking to your problem about your God. That's the real biblical way. You speak to the mountain. You don't talk to God. Hey, God, I got an awesome big mountain down here. It's the biggest pile of things I've ever seen in my life. Oh, God. Will you move the mountain? Quit talking to God about the mountain. Start talking about the mountain about God. Listen, I command you in the name of Jesus to be removed and cast into the uttermost parts of the sea. I don't know what it's going to look like it, but I command you in the name of Jesus. 
God, help us to get some of the strain out of our walk with God and start putting faith in the place of the, rest, of the strain. No amount of straining on my behalf is going to move my world toward the kingdom of heaven. But if God can take my loaves and fishes, he can do a lot with my little bit. Are you hearing me today? What is God looking for? I'm going to read to you in closing. Luke chapter number 18 and verse number 8. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? God, what are you looking for? What did he say to the disciples? O oh, ye of little faith. Another place he says to them, uh, if you could all believe, if you could only believe. Another place he says, a, a, a faithless generation. In another place, he says, such great faith have I not seen anywhere in the land. In another place, he says, if you can believe, you shall receive. In another place, he says, as your faith is, so be it unto you. What is God looking for when he comes? Will he find faith? If there's any way possible, I want God to find faith in my life. I may not have five talents to offer him, but I can have some faith in his greatness. I may not have the success of, of grandeur to offer him, but he can find me with faith because it is expected of a steward that he be faithful. Would you stand with me all across the house? Lord Jesus, I'm praying for everyone here today. I'm praying that we, we would be drawn to you. I'm praying that we would respond to the word of God and that we would apply that directive in our lives and we would change the way we're living. In Jesus' name, I pray. In just a moment, we're going to have a prayer service. Before I do that, I want to, I want to do something uh, different. Uh, how many of you will admit that you need this message in your life right now? Raise your hand all across the house. You raise your hand. All right. I want to speak to you in Jesus' name. You are stronger than you think you are. And when you stand upon the promise of God, you are undefeatable. I want to tell you, God is more interested in manifesting his kingdom through you than he is in relieving any set, set of stresses or fixing any set circumstance of problems. He's interested in feeding his sheep through your miracle. He's looking for faith. And I want to pray that God would let faith fall in this house. I pray our faith would be strengthened in Jesus' name. We want to be known as people of faith. Would you tell the Lord that right now? Lord, I want to be known as a person of faith. I want to speak faith into the chaos. I want to speak faith into the doubt. I want to speak faith into the despair of this world. Let it start with me, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Our pastoral team's going to come to the front. If you have a need, I want you to exercise your faith. If you're sick in your body, I want you to be bold right now, and I want you to step out, and I want you to come down to the front, and I want you to make sure that one of these pastors anoints you with oil and speaks the name of Jesus over you. If you're facing dilemmas in your career or struggles in relationships, and you feel like you're kind of in some way or another at your wit's end, and you know you need to touch here today, don't hide in your seat. I want you to step out right now. I want you to come down to the front. I want, I want you to let one of the pastors anoints you in Jesus name because this is a house of faith and when people of faith come together there is truly a breakthrough I feel like there's people here today who you you're, you're arguing with yourself like ah it's just ah, that's just life I shouldn't pray how would you know if you don't pray you need to let give it to God here today you need to quit trying to be the solution to all your own circumstances and live by your own sense of good and evil and surrender to God and let God work and your life and manifest himself among you. Church, I'd like you to step out and come find someone up here if you would. Um, our friends and guests, you can have to come. Thank you for watching First Church Charlotte. If this video has blessed you, please like us or subscribe and share us with your friends to also bless them. If you're in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, come worship with us at 4929 North Sharon Amity Road. For information about service times and church ministries, visit us online at firstchurchclt.com. If you would like to help support our efforts, text GIVE to 704-445-5353. We pray God's richest blessings to you. Come worship with us.